Let's start again with audio. So today in our live webinar, we're going to go over reverse engineering using Fusion 360. And why reverse engineer something? There are a lot of reasons. Maybe, for example, you're taking a competitor part and trying to figure out how they did what they did. Or maybe you're just trying to replace an irreplaceable product. So in this particular episode of our live demonstration, we're going to show how to reverse engineer a ski basket, or rather a ski pole basket, because in this case, I have two ski poles that were given to me by my wife two years ago. They're absolutely stunning. They work just like a regular ski pole, but unfortunately, I broke it, and I can't replace that basket. The store is completely out of stock. So we're gonna use some skills today, combined with Fusion 360, and we're gonna show you how to reverse engineer that ski basket and be able, ski pole basket, and be able to 3D print a new one. So, let's begin. So we actually have our poles. We're going to be using those and taking measurements. What other tools might you need besides Fusion 360 itself? You're going to need, potentially, measuring tape. Not the most accurate thing out there, but in a pinch this will definitely work. If you want to take one step above, you might go and get yourself an engineering grade ruler, just like this. This is not your ruler that you used in elementary school. This is a little bit more accurate, and it does have some nice flex to it, so it's very useful. But if you really want to up-level your game, I think a set of digital calipers would be right for you. And you can get digital calipers in all different kinds of grades. You can spend $300 on them, and you could also spend $25 on them these days. So I'd recommend them. I think they're very useful. And we're going to be using this tool today. Excellent. So, we're going to jump right into our live demonstration of Fusion 360, and let's jump right in. So, on my screen right now, you should be able to see I have my ski pole. And in this particular case, I went through and I modeled the entire thing. I have the handle, I have the strap, I have the actual shaft, and I have the tip as well as the basket. But reverse engineering isn't always about reverse engineering the entire thing. It's about doing what you need to get your job done. So we're going to jump right in and get this done using our calipers and taking our measurements, right? So there are a couple of ways you can get those measurements. Oh, by the way, if you really, really want to up-level your game, a 3D scanner is a great way to capture data. So you can, you, you can get a 3D scanner in all shapes and sizes as well. You can get one for as low as a couple of hundred dollars or spend many, many thousands of dollars, and you'll get very different results. In this file in particular, you're going to see here under bodies, I can show that I have some scan data that I took of that basket. And if we look up close, although I captured the general aspect of this particular design, I'm losing a lot of detail. If anything, I would say that this particular scan is not very good and not very useful. So although scanning would be a great way to get your data, not everyone also has scanners. So today we're going to cover how to reverse engineer the good old-fashioned way. And in that case, you're, all you're really going to need is your calipers and potentially your phone because these days you have a camera on pretty much every phone that exists. So we're going to go and focus on that in particular. So let's go and hide this and see what we have here. All right. So we have a tip and you can see that I have a threaded area here for that tip. And the basket is going to end up screwing onto this and then there's a set screw to hold it in place. And so we're going to go and model this today live, and we're going to see how to do that and learn some best practices along the way. So let's go and make that happen. We're going to start with a new file, because like I said earlier, you don't have to go and reverse engineer an entire pole, including handle and strap and tip, just to be able to design the basket or replace that basket. You can start and just do the basket itself. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to go and create a new design. And we're going to start off by showing this little light bulb here next to origin to show the origin itself, the X, Y, and Z axis, as well as the X, Y, uh, X, Z, and Y, Z planes, right? The front, top, and right planes. And now what we're going to do is we're going to bring in images, and we're going to use those images today along with measurements from the calipers themselves to actually go and reverse engineer this particular basket. To do this, we're going to go to Insert, 
and we're going to say insert an attached canvas. And that's what we call it when you're bringing in an image that you took, whether it's a hand-drawn image, a napkin sketch, or even an image of an actual thing. So we're going to go and choose that attached canvas. I'm going to go and select the face or plane that I'm going to go and insert it. And then I'm going to go and select the image itself. And I have here a couple of different images. We're going to go with these images here to start. And I'm going to go and choose, let's say, this one right there. And we're going to go and zoom in. And you can see that I have a pretty good image of the basket, this being a top view image. But this image isn't going to do me any good if it's the wrong size. So what I'm going to want to do is to scale it. Now, I can scale the image directly from this menu right over here. I can do that. But getting that to be correct can be a challenge. So we have a tool in Fusion 360 that I think is really handy. If you go into the Canvases folder and you find that image that you're going to use, you can right click on the image and choose Calibrate. And this is a really neat feature in my opinion. All you have to do is select any two points on your design. In this case, this is essentially the diameter of the basket itself and go and take a measurement from the real part and actually go and input it. So here I have a basket in my hand and my calipers. Let's go and switch to see me again. Here we got our calipers. And whatever units you want to use are totally fine. So I'm going to go here and take my measurement and it appears that this basket is four and three quarters of an inch. So that's pretty good. Let's jump right back into Fusion. So we're going to go and type in 4.75 and the image is all of a sudden going to be scaled to be the correct size. Let's go and zoom out a little bit. And you can see that the image is not exactly centered, so we can go and fix that as well. We're going to right click on the image and say edit. And then I'm going to choose to use a top view so this will be a little bit easier. And I can go and move this image wherever I like. And if I use the arrows, it's going to move it just in the x, y direction. And if I use the square here, I can move this in any direction I'd like. So that's about right. It doesn't have to be perfect. Now we're going to go and do this one more time. We're going to say insert and attach canvas, choose the same plane, and we're going to go and choose the other image, this one being the bottom view. And again, you can see how I can scale this image, but realistically it's even better to calibrate the image to get it to be the right size. So we're going to go and calibrate this image as well. Again, I'm going to choose the very edge, and we're going to go and choose 4.75 and hit enter. Now this one appears to be centered, or at least really close to centered. So I'm pretty happy with it. I don't really have to make any changes there. Now what I might want to do is bring in a side cross section, because I want to get the curvature of the basket correct as well. So maybe I'm going to go and say insert an attached canvas, and I'm going to choose this plane, the right plane, and we're going to go and select an image, and this time we're going to go and use a different one here. And this one we're going to go and use this side view. Let's go and zoom in here. We're going to do the same thing like we did before. So we're going to go and calibrate this image. And this one I predict is not going to be as accurate as the rest because it's, um, it has a little bit of distortion from the actual picture. But you can see here that it's pretty decent, not so bad. Maybe I'm going to go and move this in a position. And we're going to use as the origin today the very top center of the basket. So that's pretty good. I think that's actually going to work out great. Now another thing that not a lot of people do, but I think is actually a great practice, is to bring in an extra image that might be an ISO image or some other image as reference. Because unless you have a second monitor, it might be a little bit tedious to go and grab another image of what this is going to look like and have to switch back and forth from Fusion 360 to an image viewer or Photoshop or whatever other image editing program you might prefer. So now we're going to go and say insert another attached canvas. This will be our last one. And I'm going to go and select an image. And I'm actually going to just bring in this image. And this one doesn't have to be calibrated exactly. I'm just using it as a reference for what this should look like. And I'm actually going to go and move this off on the side so that as I'm designing, I could always just go and look at this without having to leave Fusion 360. To me, that's a really easy way to do things. So let's go and start modeling up this particular basket. And remember that reverse engineering isn't very different from designing something from scratch, except for the fact that you have something to your advantage, which is you have an actual part that you can go and take measurements off of to help you along the way. So we're going to go and, again, use those measurements as we go. 
So we have a bunch of canvases in here. We're going to go and hide these. And we're actually, no, we'll leave this one up and we're going to go and start to draw a cross section of this particular item. So we're going to go and right click on this plane right here and say create a sketch. And we're going to create the main sketch that drives the shape of this particular basket. And let's go again and look at this thing in person. So we're going to go and there we go. Now you can see my screen, uh, see me rather. And I'm looking at this basket. I see a lot of symmetry here. That's going to help me quite a bit in designing, so I don't have to design the whole thing. We are going to start off with this uh, section from the side. So we're going to be looking at it this way. I see that I have a curvature from above. I'm using some engineering background to assume, and in this case I think the assumption is valid, that the thickness of the part is probably uniform or relatively uniform. So we're going to be using that. I also see that I have a center shaft and it sticks up just a little bit above the top of the basket and then quite a bit below. So we're going to go and replicate all of that. And of course I have a hole through the middle that's going to have threads. Now I don't have to go and model the threads when I'm creating the initial sketch. I can do that much later. So we're going to eliminate the threads themselves from this initial sketch. And we're also not going to include any of these grooves, at least not at the beginning. And I think we're going to be good to go. So let's actually jump right back into Fusion itself and start to draw our sketch. So we have a whole variety of tools at our disposal. So if you're creating a new sketch, you have entities you could add, like lines and rectangles and circles and arcs. And you'll notice that a lot of them actually already have shortcuts. So if you see that I'm doing something really quickly in Fusion, chances are that I'm using a keyboard shortcut. And one of my favorites is L for line. Very intuitive, makes it very easy to know what you should expect. So I'm going to hit L for line, and I'm going to go and draw a line from the origin straight down. And notice as, as I draw this, a little blue icon shows up about two-thirds of the way down my line at the moment. And it's telling me that when I click here, it's going to apply a constraint to that line automatically. So there it is. And now I have a center line. I'm going to turn this into construction geom geometry. And I could do that hitting the letter X on my keyboard or hitting construction over here on the sketch palette. And now we're going to go and actually design the basket itself. So we're going to go and using that line tool, I'm going to draw what I believe to be a rough shape here of the shaft. And I'm going to go and apply some constraints here. Then we're going to go and also put in the overall shape of this particular thing. And actually, before I continue, let's go and put in some dimensions. Now a trick for those readers out there, or viewers out there, is that if you click on, let's say, this outer line first, and then I click on the center line, all I can put in here is a radius, not a diameter. If, however, I exit out of there, and we do this one more time, this time I click on the center line first, and then this line second, before I click a third time to put my dimension in, I'm actually going to right click and change this to a diameter dimension. Now it makes it really easy to put in that diameter. Perfect. So I'm going to go and take a quick measurement, and it looks to me like this part is 0.8 inches. And actually, this is a good time to talk about units. So in Fusion 360, you can set your units to anything you want. Uh, inches, metric, centimeters, millimeters, and so on and so forth. That being said, as you're designing, whatever you've selected is really just going to be what it shows you. You can always type in another dimension. And as long as you put in mm, for example, for millimeter, or in for inches, we'll be able to convert it to whatever units you selected to display. So right now, my document is in inches, and although there are several aspects of my basket that are going to be in inches, I prefer to work in metric. So I'm actually going to go and measure this in metric, and my measurement on my side is saying that this is about 21 millimeters, and I'm going to go and type in 21 mm for millimeter and hit enter. And again, it is going to convert this into whatever your display units are, in this case, inches. Now, if you're going to be putting in metric units all the time, then it might be wise to actually switch your display units. And we're going to go and do that right here, from inches over to millimeter, and say OK. And now, for the rest of the document, uh, millimeter is going to be my primary unit. I'm also going to go and take a dimension for this inner diameter here. And again, right-click and choose diameter. And now I'm going to go and take a quick measurement here. And I'm showing this as about 13.5. So we're going to go and type in 13.5, and we're good to go. I can also take a quick measurement of the height of the basket. 
and it looks to me to be about 15 millimeters. So we'll go and put that in as well. Oh, hold on just a moment. Perfect, 15. Now I did mention earlier that we're going to set the origin to be at the very top of our basket. So for that I'm going to select the origin itself, I'm going to select this top line here, and I'm going to choose coincident as the constraint. And notice how now my sketch is entirely black or fully defined or fully constrained. And that's a good thing. It means that you're not going to be able to accidentally move your sketch around and have any kind of results that you weren't expecting. So, so far, fully constrained. Let's move on. We're going to go and add an arc to this design. And I'm going to say create an arc. And I'm going to choose a three-point arc. I'm going to design it from about here. I'm going to move this out to about here. And I'm using the image as a background. And the image is helping me out to get this approximately correct. And uh, it looks like I accidentally moved my view, so we'll go and fix that. Now, I'm going to make an assumption here that I believe to be correct. And so I'm going to try to make this line over here. We're going to go and make a construction line. And I'm going to set this arc and this line to be tangent. There we have it. I'm also going to add a dimension from the very top of the basket to that arc. And I'm going to go and measure the real one. And let's go and show you my camera again. And using the pointy part of the caliper you see at the bottom here, I'm going to go and take a measurement. And that looks to be about two millimeters. So we'll go and put that as two millimeters. Perfect. Let's go and switch back to our screen and zoom out just a little bit. This is looking really good so far. So I have my arc, and I can change the actual shape of the arc to match. But it looks like, especially if I zoom in here, and I know that the image is blurry, but you'll have the real part in real life anyway. So we're going to go and add some more geometry here. And we're going to go and add this like so. I think that's about accurate. And we're going to go and add some more constraints. Now we know that the entire basket is 4.75 inches. So let's go and put that constraint on right away. We're going to go from the center line to the outer line. And again, right click and choosing the diameter dimension, I can place this. Now remember that we switched the metric and I know that this basket is in inches, or at least the diameter is. So I'm going to type in 4.75 IN for inches and that'll be set. So that's looking really good. I'm also going to put some dimensions here based on my measurements. And I'm going to go and put that to, I think that's actually two millimeters. Perfect. I'm going to go and put a 45 degree here. Now in this case, you can measure it in a variety of different ways. If you don't want to see this as, let's say, approximately 130, you can come and switch this to that direction, and now it's a 45. And then I'm also going to come in here and I'm going to put in a dimension for this chamfer, which is about 3.5. And you can see that I still have blue sketches, right? So this can change quite a bit. I can drag this wherever I think is appropriate. So maybe now I'm going to go and get another dimension. And that dimension is actually going to be measuring on the basket itself. And what it turns out is that the very bottom of the cylinder part of the basket actually lines up with the bottom right here. So I can go and select those and say coincident as well. And now everything snaps into place. Now if you're wondering to yourself, why am I drawing this not matching the image? If the whole point of bringing in the image is to be able to match it, well, remember that an image helps a lot, but an image is not going to be perfect. So it's all about using the image to help you along the way. But at the end of the day, you have to make what you believe to be the best decisions. And those decisions are always a trade-off on whether you think the image is more accurate or those dimensions are more accurate. And more often than not, what I use the image for is the general shape. And then I use the calipers or the 3D scan data for the actual specific dimensions that I want. And in this case, as we saw earlier, my scan data was not any good. So we're going to rely entirely on my dimensions for my calipers. So here I have a pretty decent sketch, but we're not done. We want a closed sketch to be able to turn this into a 3D solid model. So I'm going to go and continue just a little bit here. We're going to go and add a horizontal line right over there. And remember our assumption earlier was that we're going to have a uniform thickness. So I'm going to want to take these items here and we're going to go and add uniform thickness to them as well. Now there is an offset command here and the offset command is really handy but in this particular case I'm actually going to do it manually. So I'm going to go and choose an arc and I'm going to draw it approximately in the right place 
And I'm also going to go and draw a line and draw it approximately in the right place. I'm going to select this arc and this one and we're going to make them concentric. And it did snap, it moved a little bit, but you can see now that it's actually matching quite nicely. And then I'm also going to take these two lines and we're going to make them parallel. Perfect. Now we're going to go and put some dimensions between here. Now here's where again you're going to go and take the actual part. We're going to go and take this and take our measurement. We're going to go with three millimeters. And that's looking quite accurate. We're going to go and set that to three millimeters. Actually, there we go. So now you can see I set that to three. I'm going to do the same thing over here. And now we're going to combine everything together. So I'm going to say these two are going to be coincident. This and this is also going to be coincident. And now I have a closed profile. Now, if you come from other software like SolidWorks or Pro-E or many of the other parametric modeling softwares, you know that many of them need you to be able to, you have to, clean up your sketches so you only have a single profile to be able to revolve. Fusion 360 has a very intelligent sketcher, and so you can actually leave your sketch just like you see right here, and everything will actually work out just fine. Now, if you happen to be a little bit more old school and you prefer to clean it up, that's totally fine too. We do have under modify the trim command, and I can come in here and trim my sketch and get rid of the extra that I don't need. Perfect, so now this is looking really good. Let's go and make this into a 3D shape. So we're gonna say stop. We're gonna go and choose a revolve command. We're gonna go and choose both of these regions right here. And we're gonna select as our axis that center line that we drew earlier and say okay. And now I have a disc of sorts that somewhat represents the basket that we're dealing with. But this doesn't exactly look like the basket that I have in my hands, right? This doesn't look like this shape. So we're going to need another sketch to be able to make this look the way it does right now. And that's where those images that we took earlier, the ones from the top view and the bottom view, those are going to come in handy. So let's go right back into our design. We're going to go and hide this particular side view image and let's go and look at our top view. Here we go. So you can see the image lines up pretty well and we're going to go and take this and we're going to sketch using that view. So we're going to go and one other thing to keep in mind is I like to always put a name to all my sketches so that later on I always know what to go back to. So we're going to go and rename this sketch and this is going to be called side view and we're going to go and make a new sketch. This time it's going to be a top view and when we're done with it we're going to go and name that as well. I always like to start off with my center line, so we're going to go and draw our vertical center line, just like we did there. I am going to turn that into construction geometry. I'm also going to start to just lay out other things that I think are going to be important. So I'm going to bring in a circle. I'm using C for circle to bring this in. I'm going to go and draw a line that's approximately following that image. And for this outer shape, I'm going to use the actual 3D model. So let's go and hide our canvas for a moment. I'm going to go under Create, Project, and we're going to project the geometry from the solid model and say OK. One other tip, by the way, right now I'm selecting the edge itself of the model. If you want a, ro a more robust file, you can actually change this. Let's deselect our geometry. Instead of selecting the edge, I'm going to change this to Bodies, and we're going to select the entire object itself. Perfect. Now we're going to go and hide the body itself, and we have that same outer circle showing up. Perfect. If I want to be really accurate, I can go here and trim my sketch. This is looking good. And let's bring our canvas back. Perfect. And this is a perfect example of where the image itself doesn't perfectly line up with my model. Can I go back and move that image? Absolutely. So one of the tricks, if you want to have it line up with your sketch that you've already created, is to take advantage of the parametric modeling that you have in Fusion 360. So everything that we did here was saved in the timeline in order. So the very first image that we're using, and we should rename this here as top view, is the very first thing that happened. But I can actually drag this to be later in my timeline. So we're going to go and drag that. So now the picture is actually the last thing that comes in, and I can go and edit it look at this from a top view, and using the actual shape here that I know is going to be accurate, I can go and move this image until I get it exactly where I want it. 
So I'm going to go and get this exactly where I want it. And now everything lines up great. And I can go back and take that image and reorder it to the very beginning of the timeline where it started off. So now, when I go back and edit my sketch again, that image is still at the very beginning of my timeline, but it's now in the perfect position. So let's go and take the circle. Let's get this a little bit more accurate. And let's go and take a quick dimension. It's about 11 millimeters. So we're going to go and put in our dimension of 11 millimeters. Perfect. We're going to do our best to line this up in the center of the image because now the image is lining up nicely. And we're going to go and trim this extra sketch here. Perfect. Up. Oh, almost. Hold on, I misselected. We're going to go and select this guy and this one. Now, I could pattern what I've already drawn, and I could pattern it all the way around and make this entire basket. But one of the other lessons that I want to make sure to impart on you is everything that you do in Fusion takes resources. And the question is how much resources it takes. And there are different things that take different amounts of resources. And so you should know that patterning a sketch takes a lot more resources than patterning a feature. And even then, it takes more resources than patterning a body. So what we're going to do today is we're going to actually model just this section right here. And then we're going to take that and pattern it and then combine it all together. So, so far, everything is looking really good. Maybe I'm going to put a dimension from the center line to this corner here. We'll make that a diameter dimension. And we'll adjust that to the true dimension, which is 25. And we're going to go and draw a line from the very center line to this circle, and we're going to basically just work with this region here. This is what we're going to work on. So everything is looking really good, except I don't have everything fully constrained, and so we're going to put in some additional dimensions. I think that it's important that when you put dimensions in, you put dimensions that are possible to measure in real life. So for example, if I want to measure from the center of this circle to the center of this one, it would be pretty hard because I'd be measuring air, right? What I can measure, however, is the inside edge of this circle to the inside edge of that circle. So we're going to go and add a point here, and I'm going to select this line right there, and I'm going to go and add a constraint to put it on that circle. Then I'm going to come over here, and we're going to add a, another center line, like so. I'm going to go and put this in the very center using a midpoint constraint. We're just going to use this like so. I'm going to make this guy perpendicular to our other line, and now I have a mirror plane, or a mirror. it's really an, a line that I could use for mirroring, which also means that I could use that same trick to be able to measure diameter. So I'm going to use D for dimension, pick this center line, pick this point, and now change that to a diameter dimension, and now I'm measuring something that I can truly measure. So let's go and do that. 68.15. That's going to work for me. And here I have my dimension. Now, if you truly trust the image more than you trust uh, the measurement, that's fine too. You can go and put that back to where it was, and that'll be perfectly fine. Now, my sketch is still blue. So it looks like I can move this quite a bit. So we're going to go and put in a dimension for the angle. And I believe this is going to be 22.5. Last dimension we're going to put in here is going to be from the center line to this point right here. And we're going to go and put that at 27. And now we have a fully constrained sketch. Let's go and hide our canvas. And it's looking really good. Now remember, I'm only focusing on a portion of our design. I'm not focusing on everything because I can save time by replicating this in a pattern. But again, instead of patterning the sketch or patterning the feature, we're going to end up patterning the bodies to minimize the resources taken by Fusion and therefore have a file that's going to be able to solve much quicker and more robust. So this is perfect. Let's go and show our solid body. Let's go and take this shape right here, including the very center, and we're going to go and do an extrude. And one of the coolest things about Fusion 360, in my opinion, is that whenever you're doing a feature like the extrude, you can have this be a cut, which is what you're seeing right now. You can have it be a join, and you could even do other things like make a new body or a new component, or in this case, intersect. 
And intersect is really going to keep only what intersects between the sketch and what your object is. So we're going to say OK. And this is exactly what I wanted. And let's actually show you what this would look like if you were going to jump ahead a little bit. So we're going to say create under the solid drop down. And we're going to make a pattern. And we're going to do a circular pattern of this particular object. Instead of faces, we're going to use bodies. Select this body right here. And we're going to go and choose an axis and rotate it around. And I believe there are going to be eight of these. Let's go and see what that looks like. And it looks like I forgot a step. And it's important that you know that everyone is going to make mistakes, including myself. So let's go and fix a step. Actually, we can leave this because we'll have it fixed automatically. So we're going to say OK. And now I have eight of these halves. So let's actually go back one step in our feature tree. And before we do the pattern, let's go and do the mirror command. So we're going to go and say mirror. We're going to, instead of doing faces, we're again going to select bodies. We're going to mirror using the right plane and say OK. And then we're going to combine these two halves together. So now I have both halves. And we're going to jump one step forward. And I want all of you out there to predict at the same time, what do you think you're going to get if you mirror this instead of what you had before? And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised you have an entire basket, right? Because before, we only had half. We mirrored it around. And we had a lot of gaps. Now we have the full shape, or at least two halves down across the center line, rotated around eight times, and now you have the basket. And so all we're going to do now is go and combine. We're going to take the primary, which is that first one, as the target. And then we're going to select all of these as the tools and say OK. And now I have a basket. Now you're probably thinking to yourself that we don't have everything that we want. Let's actually go and look at the real one for a second. You can see that we're missing these cool V grooves. Other than that, it's actually looking pretty good. We are definitely missing the thread down the center and the hole for the set screw. But those are the three things that are remaining. So let's go and work on that. We're going to jump right back into Fusion. And let's start with the V groove. Now, I looked at the actual basket, and I thought of a lot of different ways that we could have made that V groove. And I think to myself, the way that they did it, and, and ultimately, that's what I want to accomplish. I want to accomplish the way that they did it. I want to replicate it. So we're going to use the fact that we have a parametric modeling software. And you can always go back in time, change your sketches, use the changes for new features, right? You, there are a lot of endless possibilities there. So we're going to go back to our original sketch. And we're going to add some geometry here. We're going to add another arc. And we're going to start it right over here. And for now, I'm just going to drag this off into space. And I'm going to use the same trick that I used over here. And by the way, we'll go and clean this up while we're at this. Perfect. We're going to go and add a line from there, horizontal. We're going to make a construction. I use the letter X as a shortcut to do so. And we're going to make this tangent. So this arc that I'm drawing is going to be the very bottom of the groove itself. So I'm going to go and take a measurement. Let's go back here. And we're going to measure what is the depth of this groove relative to the side here. And it looks to me to be about 3 millimeters. So we're going to go back into Fusion here. And we're going to go and put a dimension between these two here. And we're going to set it to 3 millimeters. Actually, let me double check that measurement because it looks like it lines up too perfectly with the other. And I measured incorrectly, so I'm glad that we redid this. We're going to go and change this from 3 to 3.5. The fact that it's lower than the original sketch doesn't phase me whatsoever. We're going to go and fix that. And we're going to take this arc, and I can move this wherever I like. Now, if I'm looking at the original, and actually, let's bring up our canvas. This is a great time to talk about how we made a fourth image. Let's go and take this one. And you can look at this at any point whenever you think it's useful. So if I'm looking at this V groove, I could see that it terminates. The very beginning is what we started right over here. And the very end is going to be important as well. And the very end appears to me to end up exactly right here. So I'm going to go and take this very end, and we're going to snap it to that spot. Everything turns black, which means fully constrained or fully defined, and I like that. So we're looking really good now. 
So we're going to go in and hit Stop Sketch. And I promised you earlier that we were going to rename our sketches so that it would be easier to remember. So we're going to come in here and say this sketch over here is going to be the top view. And I do encourage you to do that. And of course we could do the same thing with the canvases. So this canvas here I believe is the cross section. Perfect. All right. So we're going to go and draw a new plane. And to do that, we're, we're sorry, we're going to draw a new sketch. And for that, we're going to need a plane to draw on. And so we're going to go and look at our sketch again. We're going to go and look at this, and we'll hide our body. And I can see here that I have a line. This is perfect. Because I can go under construction geometry, and I could say, let's make a plane along a path. And I could choose this line as that path. The distance here is actually going to be the distance along the path. So I like to hit it at zero. And you have a 50-50 shot of zero being the right side or the left side of this line. So if it turns out it's not the one that you want, change it from zero to one and you'll get what you want. But in our case, zero is great. So I'm going to say OK. Now we're going to go and click on this plane, create our sketch. And we're going to go and make a very simple V groove. So I'm going to go and use the line command and draw that V. And notice how I did not do a perfect job on that V. Let's go and zoom in quite a bit. That's OK, because we have snaps to help us. I'm going to select where I want it to go. That's the bottom of that groove. And select the end of this V. Select OK. We're going to go and add a center line, because I want this thing to be centered. Perfect. We can add symmetry from the left, the right, and that V groove, that's perfect. And then we can also, if we want, um, go and draw a very top here. So we're going to go and select this, bring this down, make this horizontal, and we're going to select some dimension for the height. And it, this does not matter very much in this case. Now for the width of the groove, I can choose whatever I think makes the most sense. The other thing I can do is I can measure the real ones. Let's go and take a look at this. So if we look at the real body here, you can see that the line is going to cross this area right here, and that's going to be important to us. So maybe I'm going to want to go and do a projection, and we can do a projection of, let's say, this area here. Let's go and hide our solid for a second. This line represents, let's go and look at that one more time, where this arc crosses this area, and that's going to be where I want to measure my V group. So I'm going to go and make this construction, I'm going to go and add a couple of points here that I think will be useful. We'll go and set them to match this line, just like so. And now I can put a dimension of what that width is. Let's go back to our camera, take a measurement real quick. Five millimeters, go back to Fusion, type in five. And now I have it fully constrained based on real world dimensions. Perfect. So how are we going to use this? Well, we have a cross-section of the V-groove, and we have the arc that we think it's going to follow. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to use solid, and we're going to go and use the sweep command. So I'm going to go and sweep, and we're going to choose this profile and this guy. And we're going to choose for our path this one right here. And it does give me a warning right now that we're creating something that's not visible. So let's go and show our bodies. And you can see here that we're making a V-groove in our part. Now, if I just say cut, I don't think I'm going to be so happy with the results. So let's go and hit OK and see. I do have the groove itself, but one of the things to note is that because the depth of the groove was lower than the model itself, it ended up creating an actual cut through the part. And that's not exactly what I was intending. So maybe I'm going to want to go and do this a different way. Right? So maybe we'll go back to this feature and I'm going to say instead of cutting the part, we're just going to make this into a new body. And that's perfectly fine. We can do that no problem. And maybe we're going to go and take, I'm just thinking out loud here, maybe we're actually going to take this region here, this bottom region, and we're going to go and, actually no, we're going to change things up a little bit. We're going to go and make a copy of this part. So we're going to go and say move copy. We're going to select the object, and we're going to create a copy. There we go. Oh, hold on just one second. There we go. And now we have two of them. So this is going to be called vGroove. And we're going to use this as our cutting tool. I'm going to hide that. And then we're also going to have a vGroove. And this is going to be the bottom area. 
So one of the cool things about Fusion 360 is that it's not just a parametric modeling software. It is much more than that. It is a direct modeling software, and it's also subdivisional modeling software. If you're not familiar with one of those terms, let's start with direct editing. Direct editing allows you to model however you like and then change that model directly. That's why it's called direct modeling or direct editing. So in, in Fusion, one of the most handy commands is this press pull command. I'm going to go and select the bottom face of this V groove and we're going to go and grab this arrow and increase the thickness. And I'm going to go and use two and a half millimeters as our thickness. I'm actually going to change this to a new offset and then we'll go and change it to two and a half and say OK. So now we have our V groove. Let's go and hide that for just a moment here. We have quite a bit going on here. So we're going to go and take, let's rename so we can actually see this easily. We have our basket and then we have our V groove. Perfect. So what I'm going to go do here is we're going to take this area. This is going to end up being the bottom of the basket. And then after we join it together, we're going to go and remove the top. Now, there are a variety of different ways to remove this area here that's sticking out. There are a couple of different ways. One of the ways that I like would be to just go and say, let's go and modify that original sketch, make this really easy on ourselves, and we're just going to add an extension to this region right here. So we're going to go and draw this and make it horizontal, and then we're going to go and draw this line here and make this vertical, and trim these just a little bit. Now I have another profile right here. So what I could do is I could say, take this profile and revolve that. We're going to revolve it using this axis. We're going to use it as a cutting tool, but we're not going to cut everything. We're just going to cut that V groove tool. So we, there we go, and we have that. And you can see what this looks like. And now I can go and combine that with the rest of the model. Now, I'm noticing a mistake on my part, right? Because I have this V groove, and we did all of this work for patterning and mirroring and things like that. Maybe I should have done most of this earlier. Now it's not a big deal in Fusion. I can come in here and I could move things around because again, this software is going to allow me to do that, right? It's a parametric modeler and you can go and do that. I do have an area here that has a reference that I don't exactly like. So we're going to go and delete this reference really quickly and say OK. And I can move this back just a little bit. We're going to take this one and move this as well. Take these guys, move this, and we'll be on our way back to where we want it. Perfect. Now, as a reminder, because I don't think I made this clear, the reason that we are reordering things is I really want to focus on just this one part and not have to focus on everything all at once. So this is a great way to do that. And it looks like I'm just going to do a little tweak, and now we're good. Okay. So now that we've done that, we're going to go and combine these together. So I'm going to say combine. We're going to select our main object. And actually, hold on just one moment. I have to move this as well. There we go. We're going to do a combine. We're going to select the main object. And we're going to join this V groove together. Now, it's not perfect, right? I do have some areas here that are sticking out. This is where our direct editing shows really strongly. We're going to go and select these areas. They're going to be able to make these changes really easy. I don't have to do any surface modeling. All I have to do is hit the delete key and delete those regions really easily. I can come in here to the back side and again hit delete and now everything is merged together and looking really, really good. Now all that's left is to take that V groove cutter and now we're going to do another combine. We're going to choose this object, the tool, and instead of joining it like we did before, we're going to use it as a cutter. Now we're talking. This is looking really, really good. The only thing that's left over here that I'm seeing that might be an issue is I do have a funny shape right here, and we're wondering why is that? And it looks like if I go back one step and I edit this, I also have to select this other side, say OK, and now go forward, and this is looking great. But the V groove, I want it to go all the way over. So now we are going to introduce a little bit of surface model. I'm going to go to Surface, and we're going to choose Offset, and I'm going to pick this surface right here. I'm going to say OK, and I'm going to hide the solid object, and I can extend this surface very quickly and easily by grabbing all four of the edges and dragging this bigger. And what we're really doing is we're preparing the surface to be able to do a 
uh, uh, sorry, replace face command. And for replace face, you do want the face you're targeting to end up being bigger, sorry, the face you're using to replace to be bigger than the other. So we're gonna go to solid, modify, and replace face. Select this one right here, select my face, and hit okay. And now let's hide that. You can see that now I have the perfect V groove that I wanted. I don't need this surface anymore, so I can remove it, as well as some other objects that I don't need anymore. And now this is looking really good. Let's jump forward a little bit and see how this looks. We can do the combine command, and notice how the, sorry, the pattern, the circular pattern, and that actually automatically includes the v-groove because we were doing the body instead of features. And then the combine, and now this is looking really, really good. Let's go back a couple of steps and maybe add some fillets where fillets are appropriate. We're going to go and use F as a keyboard shortcut and choose the bottom of the v-groove, and we're going to go with half a millimeter. We're going to go and choose this edge right here, and we're going to go with a half a millimeter as well. Oh, there we go. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll go with one millimeter. Much better. And now let's look at the bottom here, and we're going to go, and it looks like I have an area here that's not extending. Again, with direct editing, all I have to do is hit the delete key, and it'll extend. Then I can go and add my fillets where appropriate. We're going to go with one millimeter. Now it's looking pretty good. Let's go with two. Let's go with two and a half. And now we're talking. This is exactly what I'm thinking I want. And if we look at the image from below, you can see, let's go and look at this from below, that we're trying to get this to line up with the image. Let's go with three millimeters. Nope, I think 2.75 is going to be the magic number today, and that's looking great. And then we'll go and add a fillet over here as well. We're going to go with one millimeter, and this is looking great. Hide our canvas, and now we're talking. Let's go and add a couple of more fillets that I think would be appropriate. We're going to go and add a fillet here as a millimeter. We're going to add a fillet here and here, and we're going to only make those a half a millimeter. And we're also going to fillet this edge right here, oh, that one, and this one. We're going to put that at two millimeters. See, maybe we'll change that later. And we're going to add a couple of fillets here, and I think we will be good to go. Perfect. Let's go and add a millimeter. No, that's a little too much. We're going to go and make that half, and this is looking great. So let's jump forward and see what our patterning shows us. And now we have a part that's looking really, really awesome. We only have a couple more things left before we can call this good. Let's see, we have a thread that's missing that is very important for this to work. So we're gonna go and say create a thread. We select this inner face and it's automatically going to use the size that it thinks is most appropriate. So we can also choose, by the way, right now it's a cosmetic thread. We're gonna choose to make this a model thread because I wanna 3D print this basket. And it does appear to be exactly correct because I measured my basket and it's an M14 and I measured the thread. And actually, let me turn on my camera for a second. One of the things that is important here is I need this thread to be correct. Now, it's really hard for me to get my calibers inside this particular basket to measure that thread. But remember that the basket actually came from this pole. And so I can measure the actual pitch of the thread right here on this piece and see that it's two millimeters. And so my designation of M14 by two is actually perfect. Let's go and look at that on the screen, M14 by two. And we're gonna say, okay. And that thread is looking great. Maybe we're gonna go and add, oh, we definitely need to add our set screw. And so we need to figure out what plane is most appropriate to do that. Now, if we look at the origin here, I can go and draw on this plane. And that would work just fine, but this plane is probably going to have the set screw interfere with this particular rip. So what I might want to do instead is let's look at our top view sketch. And it's easy to find it because we came in here and we named it. And we're going to go and add an additional line here. And we can pick whatever angle we want in between. Maybe this is going to be 12 point, uh, Sorry, we're going to make this 11.25. Or if we want an equation, we can come in here and select this item and say divide by 2. Easy. Perfect. 
Now we also have the ability to, just like before, saying that we're gonna make a plane on a path, we're gonna go and do that right now. We're gonna go and say, we're gonna make a construction plane along a path. We're gonna select zero, and it looks like it's already going straight to the inside edge, which is where I wanted it. And I'm gonna say okay. We're gonna go and select this plane and create a sketch on it. And now it might be wise to show the basket itself again. So now you can see it. And we're gonna go and zoom underneath here. And we're gonna go and draw a circle for our hole. Put a dimension here. We're gonna go and measure the actual hole that I need. Two and a half millimeters. Now I want this hole to be centered between the parts. And also I'm noticing, by the way, that this is a little bit off. I'm not really looking at this right. Well, first of all, I'm looking through the model, but this end of the basket is in the way. So one of the other things I like is to use the slice tool, and that lets me be able to see things really well. And it looks like I'm lined up incorrectly. So I'm gonna exit out of this sketch. We're gonna go and edit that top view sketch that we did earlier, and it turns out that really I probably should stick with this 22 and a half. I think that this is actually more appropriate. So I'm gonna go and delete this line. And I know that while I'm doing this, I'm gonna get an error downstream because when it's making that plane along a path, it doesn't know where to put it anymore because that line is gone. But I'm gonna go and reassign it. So I'm gonna say, okay, we're gonna go and reassign this plane. It says it's missing the profile. That's no problem. We're gonna go and look at our top view and we're gonna go and select this edge and we're gonna go and select zero and say okay. Now we're gonna go and rename our sketch. This is gonna be called set screw hole. Let's go and show our body. Let's go and edit our sketch. Perfect. And this is looking perfect. So maybe, for example, I'm gonna go and use the project command. And there's a shortcut for it, by the way. I'm using P for project. And I'm going to go and select that point right there. Let's go and hide our body. I'm going to go and draw a line, and I can make this snap right to the center. Perfect. We're going to make all of this construction. Excellent. We're going to go and bring this line down so it's pretty close with this projected dot. And we're going to say we want these to be horizontal. Perfect. And now I can go and take my circle and say I want this to be exactly in the center of this line. And say OK. Perfect. Let's go and show our body. We're going to go and take this circle. Oh, hold on one second. There we are. We're going to go and take this circle and we're going to do an extrude cut through this model, like so. We're going to add a fillet to this edge of 0.25. And now we're looking pretty good. Now, I'm not going to bother with putting threads on the set screw because I could just use a screw that is going to tap as it goes and at the end of the day this is going to be made out of plastic so I'm not really concerned about that anyway. I could form the threads as I screw in my screw. So the only thing left here is we're going to go and add fillets to the outer edge. The, I don't know, we're not going to select that one I don't think. We're going to select the outer edge on the top and bottom. We're going to go and select this to be, we'll call it 0.5. It's looking good. And now as you can see, I have an entire basket. Perfect. So, summary here. Three, 3D scanning is the ultimate way to be able to bring in data and be able to reverse engineer it. But you don't always have access to a 3D scanner. And you don't always have access to being able to... You don't always have access to being able to um, get fancy 3D scans. In my case, I had a 3D scanner, but the results from the scan were not very good. So you can use measuring tape, you could use an engineering ruler, and you could use calipers. Even better than that is combining one of those forms with another, which is gonna be pictures, right? So we brought in an image from the top view and an image from the bottom view, and we use those images as a basis to being able to draw our sketch and then model it. All we were trying to do is to be able to replicate the correct dimensions and the correct shapes. And as you start to use 3D modeling more and more, and you look at an object like this one, you're going to be able to anticipate what kinds of features they were using to make it. Like, was this V-groove perfectly straight, or was it following an arc? 
And you can always, of course, destroy the part to get a really accurate cross-section, right? You can run this through a bandsaw, and then now you have a really easy way to be able to take those measurements. But it's not always possible to actually destroy that part. So I always like to try to use calipers and images to be able to reverse engineer my parts. This ski, ski pole basket is a perfect example. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to 3D print this part. I'm going to probably print two of them so this way my 3D prints are going to be the same color and I'm going to have the same surface texture and the same properties between the two. But I'm able to 3D print a basket that I literally could not get anymore because they're out of stock and will be for quite a while. And I was able to do all of that simply because I took pictures, measurements, and I had access to Fusion 360. If you're interested in Fusion 360 and you don't already own it and you'd like to purchase it, you will find a link in the description of this particular video. And if you click that, it'll just take you to our e-store and have a single seat of Fusion 360 in your cart ready for you to purchase. If you are not ready to purchase and you're interested in learning more about our product, please reach out to us. We can be reached out at um, we can be reached at Fusion 360 Demo at Autodesk.com. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure.